In this idea worth action, I want to explore the idea of treating science scientifically. What sparked me on these thoughts were uh, Rupert Sheldrake's banned TED Talk and other of uh, which in turn got me interested in and just thinking a little bit a bit more about uh, Rupert Sheldrake and science and I'd like to take you on the journey that I've gone on on these thoughts. So the journey begins with a look at fads and as a uh, California American son of hippies, um, I've watched a fair, um, a fair number of fads come and go uh, throughout time. And it seems to work a little bit like this, that let's say, uh, you know, it, it often starts out with a, you know, with a counter thing. So hemp is, is banned. And then someone says, wait a minute, this is not all bad. Uh, they used to make hemp rope. They used to make this. They used to make that. And there's a backlash against the ban. And what we're looking at is a social phenomena of extremes. We don't like complexity as human beings because it requires us to think. And the thinking brain never has as much fun as the unconscious brain. It's very hard to compete with a drunken orgy, with the discipline of, you know, a healthy, happy life, etc. So we often don't. So our, our pattern is to simplify so that we don't have to think and then decide based on the simplified version in relationship to what is also simplified at the time whether something is good or bad which is very simple and then we make a decision and uh, that's kind of the end of that and we get, have the great luxury of putting it out of our minds for a considerable period of time. I think uh, hemp was largely out of people's minds for decades and how wonderful is that that nobody had to think about hemp. And then the backlash starts. Wait a minute you can make rope out of hemp. You can make t-shirts out of hemp, hemp grows really fast, hemp grows in poor soils, da 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 da. Why is hemp banned? Now partly what goes on is the values in the culture move. They're not constant. So, you know, 200 years ago, the value of tradition and contriteness and obedience was higher than it is today. So arguing with the church would be an outrage, burn at the stake. But today we have different values that are independence, uh, individuality. So, so things, so the cultural landscape is shifting. As a result, the simplified versions of things shift in their relationship with what's trending. And because we tend to do these black and white movements, things that were very unpopular decades ago, suddenly they show up as like, what's going on here? This should be popular. And then it swings back. So then we have uh, hemp t-shirts, hemp butter, hemp seeds, hemp becomes, you know, like this huge save the whole world with hemp phenomenon. Um, and when it's trending up, 
people are making money with hemp so it becomes that much more popular get on the bandwagon it's all about hemp so we so it goes up and i want to suggest that science is on one of those bandwagons of course you know there's little micro bubbles and they can last a day a year a couple of months there's bubbles that last decades there's bubbles that last centuries but what makes a bubble is a new idea that provides an extraordinary amount of value to a large number of people. And they, of course, tell their friends. And there can be a pyramid type of dynamic. You know, buy a house can be one of those dynamics where uh, it seems like a good idea, it feels great, you buy a house, the property value goes up because you bought a house and every, you know, a lot of people bought a house with you. You tell your friends they bought, buy a house, the property values go up even higher. So, and everyone's winning in buying a house. Uh, and then it gets, you know, that much higher where uh, now it's winning so easily that it's moving up so quickly you don't even have to live in the house for the idea to make sense you can buy a house let it sit and then sell it a few months later then you can buy five houses and sell them a few months later and everyone's happy because buying a house is completely unquestioned it's just an irrefutable law of nature but is it and then you have a crash and then things get complicated why why i thought housing was you know was was always good and what i want to suggest is that science is on one of those century bubbles because what science has done is extraordinarily beautiful um, it has liberated us from superstition and religious dogma so you know 500 years ago the facts were defined not by the data but by the mythology of the day so the earth was the center of the universe the earth was square the earth was flat the whatever it was this was the way it was, and this was the authority. And the, the potency, the, the almost dictatorship-like power of religions having sole authority and not being accountable to data or gods. I mean, gods don't talk and inform people, yes, I did agree with that, you know, so you, you just had this this self-appointed authority and then you had science coming along and saying that sensory data mattered and even more importantly that if you had to choose between what your body and other people's bodies recorded as data and phenomena repeatedly and what the religious leaders of the day recorded as dogma and, and fact as words of God that you would be more successful betting on the data in other words that if God said in some priest's mind uh, the apple will do this and if your measurement of the apple said it'll do this and you've got to take a bet on life you're going to win more betting on sensory data now when 
this was a little bit of a bump to overcome because at a time of high religious supremacy, which was another big bubble that was very popular because it brought a lot of value to a lot of people, it was a bubble. So everyone knew a thousand years ago, everyone knew that God existed and was like this, whatever it was. They knew that. And this was a big bubble where religion was bringing extraordinary value in the form of certainty and courage and community to groups of people that otherwise did not have that. It was bringing belonging and certainty, which are very core fundamental needs in a certain way. So up at its peak bubble there, when you go against it, your reality could go down because you could be burned at the stake or branded a heretic and condemned and all that and everyone that you knew would hate you for betting on physical data over God or over the church. But in time, because the physical reality was on the side of data and we're all affected by data, more and more people, secretly at first, decided to bet on the data and their reality went up. And so data as a doctrine went up. And then the techniques of verifying data went up. And now we live in a world where money where the majority of money, the majority of power, the majority of thought is betting on data. Meaning, when we've got a decision, do I buy this house or do I invest in the market when we do this, that we're moving in this direction where data is cresting as the paradigm that is most successful at determining success. And I think Warren Buffett is the epitome of the data-oriented investor, and he's the most successful investor of all time. And he not only bets on data, he bets on fundamental data, meaning if he doesn't care about the technical trends and the emotional trends. What he pays attention to is if a company was sold and all of its assets were sold off, could they be, could more money be generated than he's paying for the stock? That's a good fundamental data. In other words, if he's buying 1% of the company, and the assets, if the assets of the company were sold off, would give him twice the return if he got a share of those assets as the 1% he's buying, that that's a good deal. So he's betting on data. However, as with every fad, as with every successful new paradigm, in the simplicity and the laziness of human thought, it's fun to imagine that it is the only thing. It's going to provide all the answers. The whole world is a scientific equation and every problem in the world can be solved scientifically. In other words, you know, hunger, whatever, loneliness, scientific answer. Uh, we just need to find the right pill, we just need to find the... and it's just a matter that we haven't worked out all the details, but science is the best way. There already is a scientific explanation to everything, one. Science is the best way to succeed, two. And science is the only intelligent paradigm to consider. However, 
we need to look at science scientifically. Um, take the Big Bang Theory. So it's a little bit like what's the reason, what's the scientific theory for why the Big Bang, i.e. why did the whole nature of existence just pop suddenly at that moment of time and start existing? Um, what's the explanation for why it happened then? Uh, like, what was the cause of it? You know, like, it's, um, <laughs> I think Sheldrake does a nice uh, job of putting the humor that, you know, into science of give us one miracle and then we'll explain the rest with science. And the Big Bang is a, is a pretty big miracle. Um, the entire nature of everything just pop and came into existence. And from that point on, it's all been behaving completely scientifically. Um, and things like that. So what I, what I think uh, we need to do is I think science is still the best lens for understanding the movement of matter. So if you want a successful paradigm for understanding what's going to happen with these numbers, math is a science. And, you know, if you want to know what 2,800 turtles minus 600 turtles minus three turtles to death minus five turtles to malaria minus 20 turtles and you want to know what the remainder of turtles is, don't ask your intuition, don't ask a psychic, don't meditate, don't uh, consult the ancient spiritual texts, get out a calculator and you will succeed more than anything else. Um, if you want to know what's happening to your kidney at a moment of time, um, I've done a lot of energy medicine work and um, and there were times when I'd have kidney pain and the energy medicine would sometimes work or make the pain more bearable. But it was having a look at my kidney in a hospital that told me I was dehydrated. And um, hundreds of guides, you know, my, my energy practitioner brings in, you know, hundreds of guides, guides from the north, guides from the south, guides from the, the west, guides from the blue spirit, but guides from the this, guides, and then there's the this, and the white circle, and the da 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 da, da and we're all here to help you. Um, so what's going on with your kidney? Well, let's take a look at that. Da, da, da. Um, none of those hundreds of guides knew that I needed to drink more water, apparently. Uh, and yet, for uh, understanding certain psychological insights, for having a rich and meaningful life, would I take that to a laboratory? Would I sit down and do double-blind experiments in a Faraday cage or something to, to try and figure out how I'm going to enjoy my life? No, that's where my shaman has been effective. And so I think the, um, the point that I'm making about treating scientific, science scientifically is we need to understand the situations in which science is currently the most successful paradigm of the day. As part of that, we need to be scientific and realistic about the fact that the human psychology has always loved fads for the efficiency of thought that they provide. That we 
undervalue certain things and then we overvalue certain things and then we undervalue certain things and we over and we need to be scientific about that reality and the fact that that is currently overvaluing science in some areas just like it is undervaluing other areas you you literally have people today who are so into science that regardless of the fact that their bodies have felt like shit for months, when they get the data, oh, that means I should do something. Um, and they do it because of the science rather than because of the way their body feels. And this is a little bit crazy. In other words, if we're going to ignore very effective paradigms, for example, how our body feels, uh, what feels good emotionally, what gives meaning to our existence, and we're going to ask data in double-blind experiments to answer that question, even when the data shows that it is not very effective. Meaning, the data shows, the observable data shows, that if you want to heal depression, that to a certain extent, certain medications will help. To a certain extent, certain psychology and non-scientific approaches will help. Sometimes one works better, sometimes the other works better. But to be truly scientific is to look carefully at the areas that science does not have all the answers, one, and may never have all of the answers. And three, even if it has an answer, it may not be as useful as an answer coming from another paradigm. I'm a relationship coach, among other things, an author, and one of the things that I wanted to do was bring the success of science into relationship, which I'd say I've done very well in my book, Co-Creating Conscious Chemistry, that the idea that we are truly chemists, that every relationship has an alchemical dance between all the variables in you and all the variables in me and that those variables can be tracked and traced. It was a very unpopular um, idea because it requires a lot of thought and observation and scientific method. And yet, even with all of that data, the data that you know, you love me 20% more than I love you, and that has a predisposition to being tolerable, whereas you love me 50% more than I love you, and that has a probability field of 80% of being painful and or not sustainable in a matter of months to years. So you can look at data, and it can be helpful as a guide in making decisions, and yet, when it comes to who you love, and that feeling of love, having a printout of, you know, 200 variables that line up and I love you because of this, or just the feeling of I love you and you're beautiful and you make me smile. I would say that that's an area where there is science, where there can be science. And yet, the scientific paradigm is not always as beautiful, or as efficient, or as successful as a romantic paradigm. And that the romantic paradigm is not always as successful or beautiful as a healing paradigm. That sometimes we need relationships that are primarily based on the intention and the need for healing that sometimes we have relationships that are primarily based around the intention and the need for romance and play, that sometimes we have relationships that are primarily based on the need for and the desire for growth. 
and new life. And that in each case, we need to know the limits of the paradigm. Rupert Sheldrake does a great job of exploring the limits of the scientific paradigm. Two, playfully reminding us that there are some areas where science is not evaluating itself scientifically, where it is promoting itself beyond the limits to which its own scientific methods would support and that this is actually being done not on the basis of science but on the basis of popular relief at not having to think about anything else. In other words, if we can all just agree, please, that science has all the answers and will eventually get there and that this is the only path we need to follow and we just need to follow it and we just need enough money in enough laboratories across the world and we need to replicate enough things that we can verify everything in the universe scientifically and then we'll know and there won't be any discussion and the world will all be live happily ever after. If we can just please believe and agree on that then we can relax and not consider all the other philosophies in the last 10,000 years in the more than 10,000 languages that have existed uh, in 10,000 cultures. We can just wipe the slate clean, all rest easy, that we know the answer, that we know how we're going to get there, and that everyone who thinks anyone else, anything else, is an idiot, a quack, clearly very unscientific, which in a dogma is enough in and of itself. Um, and then we can feel safe, we can feel peaceful, because we have established a certainty that is not actually scientifically based, but is based on our emotional need for certainty, that some of the in, see, what, what, what's, what's also very important to understand is that need for certainty. Like, why is it that the scientific principle and reality has been extended beyond itself in areas of sheer dogma? A dogma is simply an unquestioned belief that is not verified by data. So <laughs> it's when you have the dogma of science, it, we're talking about the areas of science that has not been verified by science, but which is dogmatically put forth by people calling themselves scientists who are not behaving or speaking scientifically. They haven't done any double-blind experiments to say that what they are saying is or is not true in this or this area is the case. But they have a double standard where anyone who says anything else, they not only require the double-blind experiments and all that, they insist that they're all fraudulent if they don't add up, but they don't do any data to prove their side, one, and they don't hold themselves to that same standard. They don't hold themselves to the illusionary standard that clearly all those dogmatic scientists made the data up and are cheating. There was some way those scientists had a microphone and something in their ear because we all know those scientists are quacks and that's a given. And so the only thing we have to figure out is how those scientists hid cameras and microphones in such a way so that they convinced the world that things were more scientific than they actually were and it's just a matter of finding those hidden microphones and then you know science 
we all know is a bunch of crap. What traditionalists and dogmatists have in common is a fanatical, passionate need for certainty and a terror of the unknown. We have a world where people who are have decided to pick science as a, the simple certain thing, devote their lives passionately to attacking, very personally, anyone who seems to suggest anything is not fully scientific or suggesting that data lines up to show something that science can't explain. You have passionate vitriol, judgment, rage, personal attacks, not scientific at all. It's, it's, it's terror that the universe might be more complex than one principle, one paradigm, one dogma. And because there have always been human beings who need certainty, that have always these are the same people who were they born in the 15th century or the 12th century would have been haters of anyone who didn't go along with the church or anyone before that who would have been haters of anyone who didn't live by the ocean or live away, whatever the dogma of the day was. It's a human need to feel safe in certainty and predictability and so a group of people who have often had the most trauma in their lives for one reason or another cling to the dogma of the day more tenaciously, more passionately in an almost competition to prove that it, the dogma of the day, is the only truth and the truth for all time and the truth that will be there for all things and yet science is a beautiful principle and a beautiful paradigm that can explain so much, that has brought so much success, that it's, it's not to be undervalued or underestimated in any way, but it's also to be cautious of the simplicity and the human emotional need to overestimate the value and the appropriateness and the effectiveness of the scientific paradigm in all areas of consciousness and human experimentation and, and the whole human experience. So they, that's the idea worth acting on to question which areas of our lives can science continue to bring us growth and success in the most effective way of any paradigm available to us. And in which areas of our lives can another paradigm, uh, meditation, spirituality, etc., bring us more well-being more reliably than the science of today?